Ah, it's, you know, I feel like Persephone, but instead of six months, you know, it's, I get to come out for two weeks, you know, of the year. It's, it's so wonderful to be with you all. It truly is. <coughs> Let the disciples seize hold of the tale of the serpent of wisdom and having with firmness grasped it, let him follow it into the deepest center of the hall of wisdom. Let him not be betrayed into the trap set for him by the colorful tracery on the, of the serpent of illusion, but let him shut his eyes to that colorful tracery upon its back and his ears to the melody of its voice. Let him discern the jewel set in the forehead of the serpent whose tail he holds and by its radiance traverse the miry halls of Maya. This is from an old commentary in a treatise on white magic which references the path of discipleship in general and that period between the first and second initiation in particular. Okay, during this conference, we are focusing on the Christ and the Buddha, who, according to DK, are the second type or grade of a messenger, demonstrating and externalizing the second ray, as head, in the case of the Christ, of the second planetary center, um, the heart center of the planet, source of the second divine aspect of love, wisdom, which animates the soul, the second periodical vehicle. You might start to discern my theme here. Um, it should be no surprise then that it's the second initiation, also called the second step on the way of release, that relates the initiate to all the above once that initiate begins to gain some control on the astral plane. It's my opinion uh, that many of us in this room stand in this great gulf that stretches between the first and second initiations, consolidating the work of the first. You know, we've got it together on the physical plane to some extent, while at the same time preparing for the second. DK says, all earnest and true aspirants and disciples who work undeviatingly for spiritual advancement with pure motive and who are oriented unswervingly towards the soul have taken the first initiation. This simply connotes the birth of the infant Christ within the heart. He also says that those who have taken the first initiation will be present in the millions uh, by the time 2025 rolls around. I don't think he said rolls around, but yeah. uh, The astral plane sounds clear and starry, doesn't it? It's not. It is, we're told, filled with dense fog, changing forms and interpenetrating colors, not all of them this grim, uh, that give the impression of a confused and impenetrable disorder created by us, billions of human beings daily generating glamour through the pursuit of their, our own self-interest and our many, their many, and various desires, right? The resulting energetic distortion is so pervasive that it is, we're told, nearly impossible to dissociate one's own astral body from the rest of the miasma, and herein lies the problem. Those who are unable to define their own emotional auric boundaries easily fall prey to the glamours that surround them. I could have said eagerly fall prey because, you know, a lot of people experience their desire as a kind of hunger and they're all too happy to satisfy that desire, nature. DK tells us that the astral plane is the battleground whereon must be found the waterloo of every aspirant. Some on life, we're told, will evoke an inner response to an all-encompassing emotional crisis. 
or alternately, there will be a long period of continuous stress and strain. You get a choice, you know, you enter the life, you know, uh, that will force us to seek reality beyond the astral plane. It, the pressure will be so great that we literally uh, spontaneously seek a solution outside that space. Thus, this plane is the setting for one of the main burning grounds that a disciple must cross. Baptism by fire rather than water as in Atlantean times. Fire comes through the rod of the initiator, but before that great moment, it comes through the mind of the initiate who must reconcile the watery, illusory aspect of his or her astral body. However, rather than reducing the astral miasmas, wielding the fire of mind temporarily intensifies it. The old commentary states, the water under the action of fire is resolved into steam, and the initiate is immersed in the fogs and miasmas, the glamours and the mists thus caused. Out of this fog and out of the glamours, the initiate must emerge. But why is it called a Waterloo experience with its connotations of total defeat? Because from the point of view of the personality control, all is lost. Add to this the fact that the personality must invoke the soul to preside over its own destruction and must hold on to this invocative decision steadfastly until at the central point of the burning ground, the evocative response comes forth. Evocative decision, invocative response. Thus, we're told, the lesser light of the personality is absorbed into the greater light of the soul. And finally, the two shine as one. This personality is still there, but not at all as it was, for there is nothing of its separated, self-determined volition. The eyes of the soul become one's own eyes. All that remains of the personality is a purified shell through which the light of the soul can shine. So, well, that's nice. <laughs> How do we get to that point? The big ask, isn't it? Well, the first stage, we're told, is a discovery of the potency of the quality of our own astral auras. D.K. tells us that this quality is in all cases some distortion of the love aspect, there's hope in that, which creates an emotional sensitivity that is, quote, peculiarly and almost unnaturally strong. Anybody had that experience? In fact, at this stage, its influence is stronger than the mental body. But gradually, over many lifetimes, our mental vehicles increase their radio, radiatory potency until finally they begin to dominate our astral auras. When the mental body becomes strong enough, the crisis of the midway point occurs. An acquiescence that allows the soul to pour its radiation into the astral aura via the astral body. This great event underscores the fact that though we as personalities must work to blend the pairs of opposites, from our end, the true miracle is wrought on our be behalf by the soul and the world teacher, for by pouring their radiation into our astral auras, love takes the place of emotional sensitivity and desire. If I was a born-again preacher, that would be my lead line, right, you know? And love takes the place of emotional sensitivity and desire, you know, because that's the miracle of it, right? You know, we just have to prepare the way, be our own John the Baptist, so to speak, so that that great event occurs. Right? DK tells us, there comes a moment during the second initiation when the soul of the initiate sweeps into activity. 
I'm having a rose moment. And fundam fundamental force submerges the astral nature, vitalizing and inspiring the astral body, changing temporarily the quality of the astral aura and establishing a control which will lead finally to the substitution of love for emotional sensitivity. Imagine such a state of being. But to reach the point where we are clear enough to petition the soul in the first place, we must first work to balance and purify the astral forces within our own nature and thus loosen the hold glamour has on us as individuals and as a group. The astral is described as the plane of the vibrating poles where the pairs of opposites are most deeply felt, where we're told light and darkness interact, as do pleasure and pain, good and evil meet, and poverty and riches are offset one against the other. When we incarnate the jiva, the inner spark sent forth by the soul, clothes itself in mental, astral, and etheric substance, and thereby makes its way onto the dense physical plane, represented by the baseline of this triangle. We're told that at this stage, quote, the indwelling flame is as a tiny pinpoint. Initially, we stand at the center of this baseline, a direct reflection of our soul standing at the apex. I think we've all experienced that with infants, like we're in wondrous awe of the presence. Yeah. But as we rediscover the pairs of opposites, we begin to identify and interact with the three worlds of human endeavor and the upper point of the triangle recedes from our awareness. We lose our connection with the light of our true self, our conscious connection, and feeling the loss, we replace it with desire. So it is that we begin a lifelong pattern of continuous oscillation between the pairs of opposites, pleasure to erase pain, diversion if we're bored, quiet if we're overstimulated, hunger and satiation, the spotlight and solitude. Uh, the list of dualities is endless. This susceptibility to the glamour of the pairs of opposites rules us lifetime after lifetime. In fact, for most of our passage through the fourth kingdom in nature. But finally, during the period that many of us find ourselves in now, between the first and the second initiations, DK called, which DK calls a cycle of perfecting, there comes a gradual yet profound inner reorientation until a point is reached where the disciple becomes consciously aware of the fact that his or her own emotional nature, lower psychic faculties, and potency of glamour are all at odds with what has become for that disciple a definite inner goal. Though developed beyond the average, the disciple's mind is not yet strong enough to impose control over this chaos of constant emotional reaction and conditioning glamours that buffet and darken his or her astral body. Without knowledge of those spiritual energies which will dissipate glamour. The period that it takes to gain this knowledge is, we're told, the worst time of distress and difficulty to which the disciple is at any time subjected. Why? Because all the astral chaos generated during eons of incarnations has to be clear before any further progress can be made. How this is done brings us to the task that faces so many of us, to balance the forces of our own inner nature by equilibrizing the influence of the pairs of opposites that generate glamour, to bring to bear a lower reflection of the law of polar union, which binds the pairs and fuses all dualities. Why is it necessary to do this? Because one, Freedom from the influence of the pairs of opposites clears the chaos of energies of the astral body. And two, 
a state of equilibrium allows the soul to tune the resultant quiescent vibration to a higher note. So if you seek the middle point, then you are staged for the re-identification with the higher point. But you have to um, balance the pairs before that can, event can occur. More good news. DK says, when the point of balance is reached, then the occupier of the form is liberated from the sheath, which has hitherto acted as a prison, and he can escape from an environment which he has utilized for the gaining of experience and as a battleground between the pairs of opposites. The results of liberating oneself from the grip of the astral plane are far-reaching. For the second initiation brings with it freedom from the vibratory impulses of the physical body. It brings a translucent astral body wherein all that remains is aspiration, which TK describes as, quote, a sensitive response to all forms of divine life, a vehicle through which the lowest aspect of divine love, goodwill, can flow without impediment. Through the second initiation, we also complete our passage out of the halls of ignorance. We experience the unfolding of the knowledge petal of the second tier of petals of the egoic lotus. That's number five on this chart. And we gain the ability to create and wield mental matter, which will allow us to actively cooperate with the hierarchy. The soul will then be able to use the astral body and mold desires so that it is in line with divine purpose, which allows the new initiate to work with the outer world of forces without being overwhelmed by them. It's that love having replaced emotional sensitivity. Then he or she begins truly to be in the world, but not of it. Occultly, this is called becoming the path. This initiation returns the disciple to the equilibrized center of the baseline, where the initiate becomes consciously connected with the soul at the apex of the triangle. This is the true rebirth in spirit. We're told that one of the main purposes behind the return of the Christ, who presides over both the first and second initiations, will be the daunting task of reorganizing the emotional and psychic life of humanity. In the meantime, all the work we do to equilibrize the pairs of opposites that plague our astral vehicles helps clear the way for his reappearance. So, how do we do this? Fortunately, there's a lot written on this subject. Starting on the physical plane, the first preliminary step is what DK calls a practical purity of life. This purification initiates the process of calming the astral body, which allows for the next step, one of the five Ds that uh, Michael was talking about, the cultivation of dispassion. It's the second one. First one is discipline and then dispassion. Dispassion is not, you know, it sounds like, wow, I don't get to be passionate anymore. It's not hard-hearted or uncaring, but is rather a shift from reaction to response. From passion to compassion and eventually turns all desire into aspiration, including the desire to experience the fruit of one's own service-oriented actions, right? That may be the last one to go, yeah. This passion is a mental perspective that stands above and thus outside the emotional influence of whatever pairs of opposites is being experienced. Shifting our focus to this vantage point reveals that which the two poles of whatever pair of opposites we're engaged in energetically have in common. Did you get that? 
It's like in the space of the astral pair, they reinforce each other's reality. So you're just bouncing off. I'm not happy. I'm happy. You know? and, and there's something that, that lifted point, which is in the mind, which is why it's so important to become mentally polarized, um, sees the commonality of these pair energetically. So we then see that um, from this vantage that seeking the positive rajasic pole of the baseline, you know, that's what humanity is after, right? That, that feel-good rajasic pole, that it doesn't free us, but in fact sets the stage for a swing back. We could do, you know, we could choreograph the pairs of opposites, right? This is, Right? But what you want to do is add that third beat in there, you know, with the walls. One, two, three, one, two, three, right? <laughs> I wasn't planning on that. But so <laughs> so um, it says the pole for the swing back to the negative tamasic pole, whereas the pitching of our awareness into the mental realm of dispassion eventually brings about a freedom from emotional reaction to any and all the pairs of opposites. You get it that it's not about suppression. It's not about stealing your emotional nature of becoming, you know, a cold person, you know, that it's unmoved. It's about perspective. And you're completely, in fact, you're more aware of the existence and energetics of the pairs than you ever were. But in order to escape this constant oscillation, we must meditate on and thus draw ourselves toward the dispelling energy of dispassion. For just the effort made to step up and out of the influence of the pairs of opposites will loosen their hold, just the effort. And each successive encounter will bring more insight into the sattvic quality of that particular upper point. Every time you're successful in achieving that balanced higher point, you defeat the entire process of being unconsciously uh, oscillating between the pairs. So eventually, we come to recognize that though these points of sattvic awareness have a distinct quality in terms of the relationship to the particular pairs of opposites that they are equilibrizing, this sattvic aspect is essentially one unified quality or perspective imbued by the light of the soul. You're really just returning to that same place every time, right? It has a particular relationship to the pair you're working with, you know, uh, uh, pleasure and pain, whatever. But it also is unified as the sattvic point or perspective that equilibrates all the pairs of opposites. DK says this balanced condition allows us to see the not self and the self, the life aspect and the form aspect as they essentially are. I mean, that's really the ultimate pair, isn't it? The self and the not self. You know, you get that one and all the others just like line right up. When we've had some success at establishing a dispassionate point of view, we begin to, here's another good one. Doesn't start with a D, but it's right up there. <laughs> Acquiescence. We start, we begin to acquiesce, to neutralize that which impedes our recognition of the truth about ourselves. And thus to see our particular array of glamours for what they truly are, energetically charged distortions that polarize us in emotional reactivity and thus bind us to the form aspect. This marks the shift from a content-based to an energy-based understanding of the glamour generated by the pairs of opposites in our lives. Which makes, it, which makes it much easier to break the hypnosis of whatever glamour, the driving force behind desire, is influencing us. Because of our intense identification with astral phenomena, 
The initial phase of this work, of the conscious application of dispassion, these initial stages are the hardest. But ultimately, we're told, dispassion dispels all desire for the separated self, for the emotional nature is rendered immune to the appeal of the senses. D.K. says, I love this one, stand at the center of dispassion with heart of flame, yet still. That's that sattvic point. Okay. Concurrent and interconnected with the cultivation of dispassion is the raising of the fire that expresses itself through the solar plexus to the heart. The solar plexus ruled by the sixth ray is humanity's wide highway into the astral realm. It carries within it, we're told, the material aspect of feeling for it is a recipient of all emotional reactions and desires, and is thus the center for the reception and expression of the pairs of opposites. The solar plexus, get a little picture of it going here, is the center in the etheric vehicle through which most humanity lives, moves, and identifies itself. The petals of the solar plexus, which in Atlantean times faced downward in order to uh, receive and pass energies to and from the lower chakras have changed polarity during the present root rays. Did you notice that happening? Um, and now face upwards towards the heart chakra. You can imagine how much easier it makes this whole process, right? In the present epoch, epic epoch, never know how to pronounce that word. Uh, the solar plexus has become the clearing house for all the energies of the centers below the diaphragm. Everything goes through the solar plexus, gradually refining them to the point where transference into the heart center becomes possible. Depending on one's ray type, but generally speaking, after the shift from the sacral to the throat chakras, the energy from the solar plexus begins moving towards the heart center. As DK says, to escape the prison house of the lower regions. God, just imagine what he sees. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you meet DK and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> as it does so, the, um, sorry, it, there's, there's, there's not going to be an hour of comedy this year, but I, you know, I can't let it go entirely. <laughs> Uh, the, as it does so, the energy is transmuted and the heart center slowly begins to reverse its polarity due to the pressure from this rising energy as well as from the pull from above. This process is progressively intensified during the first two initiations. Movement from the solar plexus to the heart center makes it much easier to discern and dispel the glamour of the pairs of opposites. You see these, all these things are going on at once. DK says, from the angle of esoteric sciences, love and reason are synonymous terms. From the angle of the esoteric sciences, love and reason are synonymous terms. You know, that's, that really, uh, tightly wraps the concept of love with wisdom, doesn't it? Through reason, love disperses the energy of glamour, and wisdom helps to equilibrize the pairs of opposites. The effect of the transfer of the energy to the heart is described in this old commentary. When the fire is drawn from the inmost point within the heart, the waters suffice not to subdue it, the waters being the astral plane. Like a stream of flame, it issues forth and traverses the waters, which disappear before it. Thus, the goal is found. So, service, we're told, is the mode par excellence for awakening the heart center. You know? But it must be initiated as a result of a selfless recognition of need, not as a result of personal need to feed the emotional gratif gratification that service brings. A lot of people get caught in that trap. Um, it's, you know, go for the vibration. I mean, 
You won't be fooled. An attitude of dispassion, of dispassion allows us to develop discrimination. Now the word discrimination as it is normally used describes a function of the lower mind applied to the world of appearances. On the other hand, discrimination as DK uses the term in some ways is exactly the opposite of how it works down here, right? Uh, you know, not this, uh, this one. Give me the glazed donut. I, yeah. um, The uh, discrimination as DK, DK uses the term requires a developed mental sensitivity that allows us to distinguish the quality and nature of various energies. Using discrimination to free ourselves from the influence of the pairs of opposites necessitates the development of a conscious, focused mental sensitivity of our soul rate. That's a very important statement. That's the lifeline. That's the serpent whose tail you grab is the ray of your soul, the energy of the ray of your soul. For the soul ray is, I just said it, the tail of the serpent of wisdom that will guide us up through the astral realm. <coughs> Using the discrimination of the higher mind opens us to the realm of spiritual energies from which we attract a more refined set of values which in turn increases our ability to dispel the hypnotic influence of the pairs of opposites. So the further you travel this path, the easier it gets. Of course, also, the more inwardly you go and you discover um, illusions, uh, I should say glamours. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a, a glamour with a creamy myavic inner center and coated in a nice chocolate covering of, of illusion. Um, uh, don't take a bite. Okay. Okay. So the third tool used, this is discrimination, third tool used to free oneself from astral influence and a natural result of the other two is detachment from the seen, the false, the objective and the unreal. DK says, the sequence is first dispassion, then discrimination, and finally detachment. On these three words must all disciples meditate if they are ever to reap the fruits of sacrifice. The work of detachment, which comes about through the discipline of dispassion and discrimination, on the part of the disciple is met by a steady intensification of the potency of the egoic ray on the part of the soul. Discerning and responding to our soul ray allows us to, number one, build the antikarana, which occurs as a natural result of dispelling glamour. And two, raise our energetic expression the defining aspect of the self from the solar plexus to the heart. So you see how these are all interconnected, right? And you can work them from whatever angle seems most natural and according to your ray type, most certainly. As you know, the antikarana, which the old commentary describes as a focal point and distributive agency for descending light and for ascending radiance, is the bridge that we are in process of building from the lower mind to the soul. And then after the second initiation, on to the higher mind, the lowest point of the spiritual triad. We do this through our imaginations, which stimulates our ability to discriminate. Discrimination eventually opens the door to the intuition, which DK defines as divine insight and comprehension through which illumination of the personality becomes truly possible. Because intuitive understanding superimposes itself or the act, over the activity of the concrete mind and thus over the lower personal self, very much in the same way that the, the uh, sensitivity of love, is the way DK describes it, um, transmutes the sensitivity of emotional response. So you have, you know, in some signs, you know, mercury, it falls. The idea there is that you are to respond to the intuition, right? Um, 
so that you're working with the intuition on mental levels finally and the love sensitivity in the astral realm. This exposes the knowledge aspect to the clear, pure light of divine understanding, an aspect of the will of the monad, which focuses itself through the personal will, destroying as by fire all elements of self-will. Thy will, not mine, be done. But there's an, you know, an earlier phase of that, uh, acquiescing to the soul. Um, you know, at first, the soul agrees, you know, sometime when you're a real putz, you know, early in the process, it agrees to take you on. Oh, my God. <laughs> see, let me check my schedule. Let's see, the next five million years. Oh, okay. okay, right? That's the first acquiescence. The second acquiescence comes during this period that we're talking about, where you energetically shift you reach that central point and you realize that it's towards the soul that your life is, is going. And the call of the personality is just not as strong anymore. And that's the acquiescence of the personality to the soul. This is the second acquiescence. DK says, this monadic content Contact becomes possible from the moment that the first thin strand of the antikarana, more good news, first thin strand of the antikarana is completed between the mental unit and the monastic permanent atom. For when the disciple has flung one strand of living light through the power of magnetic love across the space separating the triad and the personality, he discovers that he is a part of a group. This group recognition, faulty and unintelligently expressed at first, is the factor which enables him to pass along the anchored thread into the ashram of, the, of a master, right? So it's, you know, um, um, ask not what your ashram can do for you, <laughs> but rather what you can do for your ashram. So creating this first thin strand demonstrates, we're told, as an absorbing devotion to the plan as it progress is pr progressively understood and grasped, which takes us to a point of two minutes. No, takes us to a point uh, in our development where, as the old commentary puts it, the initiate finally detaches himself from the furthest point upon the outer rim of life and sweeps with purpose towards the central point. I just love this. Uh, you know, that idea of throwing out that thin, that's what he says, you know, you throw out that thinnest filament of strand, right? It's really towards this central point that you're doing that. You know, that's, that's your lifeline and that's, um, you know, that's your rescue ship is that central point there. Um, for all you lifeguards out there. See, the effort to, quote, detach himself from the furthest point is met by a sounding forth of a new note from the soul and a shining forth of the light in the head called the lighting of the lamp, which aligns the lower with the higher through a downflow of illumination to the brain. Pouring forth this illumination serves to dispel the world illusion this light of the soul, now anchored in the head, also results in the creation of a thought form resulting from the united meditation of the soul. This is really important. Um, this light of the soul, now anchored in the head, results in the creation of a thought form resulting from the united meditation of the soul and the personality, which takes on a triple form each infused with the will of the soul. The presence of this potent new soul-infused thought form, whose triple nature is sustained by the heart, throat, and ajna centers of the disciple, anchors the soul in the personality vehicles in such a way that it poses a threat 
to the dominion of the lesser self and the battle for control over the indwelling jiva takes on a new intensity. This renewed conflict, which takes place on the astral plane, is enacted in the Bhagavad Gita's Kurukshetra. That great battle wherein Arjuna stands midway between the two opposing forces of good and evil, spirit and form, and searches for the right attitude to both. In this moment, he represents the astral body, which must choose to be either attentive to the soul, the egoic impression represented by Krishna, or be swayed by the forces of materialism. This is that great choice, which we're told comes during some pivotal life, right? Waterloo. Krishna implores, this is Arjuna's Waterloo. Krishna implores Arjuna not to shrink back, then gives him a vision of the glory which can radiate from the form aspect when it is indwelt by God. A vision followed by this deeply esoteric teaching. Making equal good and ill fortune, gain and loss, victory and defeat, gird thyself for the fight. This is the equanimity, the balancing of the pairs of opposites necessary for taking the second initiation. Arjuna's hesitation to engage in the battle comes from the fact that he's confronted by enemies who are members of his own household, which esoterically represents aspects of his own personality and nature. So how does Arjuna triumph? He intones the Gayatri, right? Unveil to us the face of the true spiritual sun, hidden by a disk of golden light, that we may know the truth and do our whole duty as we journey to thy sacred feet. Thank you very much. <laughs>